the Earth. But from space, it is the blue planet, the only one in our solar system. 70% of it is covered by the oceans, with an average depth of six kilometers. Across that 70% of the planet, ships carry 90% of everything. It is the highway of globalization. It teems with fish, high protein food, but it is not only the surface of the oceans and seas and the 1600 meters or so that are fished that sustain mankind and hold promise for the future. Beneath the oceans, the hydrosphere, 70% of the solid surface of the planet lies submerged. The sea bottom has the same resources and characteristics as the continents. Valleys, plateaus, mountains, minerals and fossil fuels. That means that 70% of everything we may need in the future lies beneath the sea. Until now, most of those resources have been inaccessible. Only on the continental shelf that surrounds the continents but modern technology is now opening up the possibility of gathering resources from the abyssal depths. Across the blue planet, longitude, and therefore time, is measured from the Greenwich Meridian, the prime meridian of the world since 1885. The Royal Observatory, the Royal Museums of Greenwich, the old Royal Naval College, which houses the University of Greenwich's headquarters and the Cutty Sark all bear witness to Greenwich's cardinal role in marine and maritime matters. Greenwich itself stands on the River Thames, a wide motorway running right through the middle of London. Upriver lies the International Maritime Organization, the UN agency responsible for governance of the oceans and the City of London. Still, the centre of maritime law, which based on English law, marine insurance and ship broking. The maritime dimension is enormously important for Greenwich as a university for two reasons. The first is historical, that the university is privileged to be housed in the former Royal Naval College here at Greenwich. Before that it was Greenwich Hospital, founded in the 1690s to look after old sailors who had served their country at sea. Uh, and we've got a number of other historic buildings around the National Maritime Museum and the Royal Observatory on the hill above us. But secondly, the 21st century is going to be the maritime century. It's the driver of globalisation. There are a number of departments within the university, not only here at Greenwich, but also downriver at Chatham, at the Medway campus, uh, which are looking to the opportunities uh, which the maritime dimension will provide. People should come here to study maritime matters because we do have a dedicated uh, facilities to look at maritime issues which are of course multidisciplinary. But second, we are located on the River Thames just down river from the City of London which is a world centre for ship the shipping industry, for marine insurance, for ship broking and maritime law. Uh, and Further upriver we've got the International Maritime Organization which is the UN agency responsible for running the 70% of the planet which is covered with water. And finally downriver we've got two great ports, Tilbury and the New London Gateway Port. So we've got plenty of practical hands-on experience right on our doorstep. The University of Greenwich is the logical place to study maritime matters and for maritime research. We have the key drivers of the maritime world on our doorstep. But there is more. Downriver, the University of Greenwich occupies another former naval establishment. The former HMS Pembroke, the university's Medway campus, which stands next to the Chatham Historic Dockyard. Here, the Faculty of Science and Engineering and the Natural Resources Institute also undertake maritime related teaching and research. Greenwich Maritime Institute teaches maritime history, international maritime policy and maritime security. Our students come from a wide variety of backgrounds. 
for international policy and for maritime security. They're often people who've been at sea for a while or in the maritime industries and are mid-career, so mid-career is in their 30s, uh, and they're coming ashore and they want to change to management, so they need a, a higher degree. History is slightly different. We get a few people who've just done their first degree, so in their 20s, but quite often they're people in their 40s and 50s who are just doing maritime history because they enjoy it. Maritime history is important, and I would say that as a senior lecturer in it. If you don't know the context, it's very difficult to make any decisions now or in the future. If you don't know where things have come from, you're making things in a vacuum. Plus the fact it's just sheerly, purely fascinating. You know, you're sitting in buildings which are 300 years old, which sit on, on foundations which are 450 years old. Henry VIII was born here, Elizabeth I was born here. You know, history is suffused throughout Greenwich. The Department of Mathematical Sciences has made important contributions to modelling the way people behave to develop the most effective means of getting people off ships in an emergency. Professor of Computing Mechanics Chris Bailey was involved in the restoration of the Cutty Sark. We did three projects uh, on the ship. One was the conservation, and that was using finite element methods to predict the way the ship would behave during its dismantling and uh, as it was put back together again. And most importantly, predicting the structural behavior of the ship when it was raised in the air. The second project was the preservation of the ship. And there we're using statistical type methods with sensors to predict how the ship would uh, corrode over the next 50 years. And that's very, very important in terms of maintaining the ship. The third project is interpretation. Uh, Cuddy Sark was a very, very famous ship, known for its speed. And um, we're building computational models to predict why the hull of the ship, the design of the ship was unique. And most excitingly, what we're going to do here is digitally, virtually, race the Cutty Sark against its great rival, the Thermopylae. The Medway Queen is an entirely different thing. This is uh, a 1920s paddle steamer, um, which was a tripper ship around Southend and the Medway, and you know, carrying holidaymakers. Um, it had been built in Scotland um, in the 20s and didn't comply with any of the rules for design of ships at the time. How they got any sort of permission to take it to sea with people on it, I do not know. It had completely rotted away. A conservation trust had been formed. They had rescued the engines and all the bits that hadn't rusted away and had got funding from Heritage Lottery Fund to build a replica hull to exactly the same form of construction as had been built in the 1920s. So it's very thin steel sections, hot riveted together, which is very unusual to do nowadays. Because of the work on Cutty's Ark, we got the job of doing the full structural analysis of the ship in various sea states, wave heights, numbers of passengers. And it was a very complex structural analysis. It was built in Bristol, in a dock in Bristol, and the hull was towed round to Medway for completion. It's being fitted out in Medway. The engines are being put back in it. And I think it will be used for trips across to Dunkirk and things like that. Uh, we're sort of working towards um, optimizing hulls for cell propulsion. So we're starting We've extended it back to um, an East Indiaman and we pushed it forward to one of the last built steel sailing ships. And the hope is that we can actually derive some sort of metrics from this for cargo efficiency, the low cost of transporting cargo by sail alone. And there are now more and more um, shipping companies who are seriously looking at wind assisted power. With 90% of the world's trade by volume carried by sea, maritime security is a crucial area and growth industry. Somali-based pirates have made the Indian Ocean a dangerous place. Piracy is defined under the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea as any act of depredation committed on the high seas, that is to say beyond 12 miles from the shore in international waters. There's been a great deal of debate in recent years about private maritime security companies. It's often said that uh, 
a ship with armed guard, no ship with armed guards on board has been uh, taken by pirates. I'm sure that will happen before too long. But the problem with that is, is that armed guards have to be properly uh, trained, monitored, and there have to be mechanisms in place to do that. Now we here at the University of Greenwich, we work very closely with the Security Association of, for the Maritime Industry, which is seeking to uh, impose standards across the industry to make sure that anybody who is put on a ship with uh, weapons in order to deter pirates is, is properly trained. There are two, possibly three, levels in the fight against piracy. The most obvious one, counter-piracy, is what goes on at sea in terms of the way you protect merchant ships with razor wire, uh, other security measures, uh, maybe with armed guards which are becoming increasingly common, and also with naval patrols to come to the rescue of a ship which gets into trouble, citadels on board where the, the crew can go and shelter until help arrives. That's counter-piracy, but that's only part of it. The origins of piracy lie ashore in, in the uncontrolled space which provides pirates with safe places to hide. So it's about restoring order and the rule of law in those countries like Somalia uh, whence piracy comes, and that's a much longer term task. And somewhere between the two is the attack on the pirate business model because piracy is about making money. So funds have to be transferred, whether it's ransoms and so on. Also, those operating pirate operations uh, will need to supply their ships and provide weapons. So if you attack those routes, uh, that's another key part in the fight against piracy. At Medway, the Natural Resources Institute has been working on environmental issues affecting the oceans. Dr. Peter Burt is a principal scientist in the Institute. He heads the university's MSc in Sustainable Environmental Management. We're trying to understand aspects of the marine environment from a number of uh, points of view. We're interested in weather and climate and how those future interactions uh, will operate and what the consequences of those will be. Colleagues are looking at sustainable development of the oceans uh, as a food supply as well. So we can harvest the resources, the, the abundant resources of the oceans in a sustainable way, in a directed way in the future while safeguarding the needs of that environment. The oceans represent a vast resource on this planet. Uh, they control our weather, our climate, they're a source of food. Yet we know less about the oceans and some of the processes operating them than we do about the surface of the moon. In order to develop our planet sustainably, we need to rectify that. At Greenwich, the China Maritime Centre is developing as a hub for links with China, which is developing into the world's greatest maritime power. Dr. Minghua Zhao heads the centre. China, as in Britain, um, is a very important maritime nation with a long maritime history, slightly bigger. <laughs> um, China has a coastal line of 18,000 kilometres. And in terms of the territorial waters under its uh, jurisdiction, China has about 3 million square uh, kilometers. It's about one third of, the, of its land area. So China is a big maritime uh, nation. As for the importance of um, the seas and the oceans to China, today is China and there are many factors, but I would like to note two particular uh, key factors here. One is economic, the other concerns China's national defense and security. Economically, um, the maritime related activities contribute about, one, uh, about 10 percent of China's total GDP, which is a colossal figure. Actually. Along the coastal provinces like Fujian and Shanghai, like Dalian, coastal cities and provinces, the figure jumps to 16% of the GDP, so it's uh, uh, very significant. About 34 million jobs are of uh, maritime related um, activities. But the sea is under threat. The 1.4 billion cubic kilometers 
333 million cubic miles of water in the oceans do a great job absorbing much of our carbon emissions, but that means they are becoming more acidic. That is a threat to marine life, and so is other pollution, plastic waste. But the ocean is fighting back, and not always to our benefit. Global warming will mean that sea levels rise. By 2100, if carbon emissions are not dramatically reduced, it is widely predicted that there could be a one meter rise in sea levels. That would put much low-lying land underwater. The University of Greenwich is at the forefront of research and education about the sea. The long history of mankind's association with and dependence on the sea scientific, engineering, policy and security research, and debate. Greenwich, a maritime university.